I've been uh, looking forward to this for a long time. You never know, um, um, as we saw last week, that uh, you know when changes are going to happen in our uh, trade relationship with uh, NAFTA. Um, I think uh, uh, we're pretty excited about this uh, about this uh, panel. Uh, there's a lot of different views from go uh, you know the uh, two of our three governments, and uh, although, although uh, Jody and I both uh, served in government uh, in the U.S. government in the past, I mean we can get views from three different. Uh, governments, but also private sector, and um, um, and we take a look at how you know where we are with NAFTA, where we've come, and uh, and but spend most of our time on thinking about what the you know what the future is uh, from here. Um, if uh, you know go you go back uh, 25 years or so and and think about NAFTA, that we, we we do have this sort of nostalgia for a time where because because trade issues are difficult today. Um, we look back and think uh, that, that so there was this time in the past when they were really easy to do and trade deals were, were easy to do. And, and I always have to remind people who don't have gray hair that uh, they were never really easy to do. They were always, they were always difficult to do and uh, trade has always been uh, somewhat of a political football. I will acknowledge that maybe it's more difficult uh, today, but they've always been difficult. Uh, but, but NAFTA in particular is a political, is a political football. It's a unique uh, trade agreement. Um, uh, we did have a hard time getting it uh, getting it passed uh, back in uh, back in the day, and I remember uh, what the thing that sticks in my mind the most from that period was the then Vice President of the United States, Al Gore, having to go on television and uh, debate uh, this little guy from Texas named Ross Perot, uh, where he talked about the giant sucking sound of uh, jobs. Uh, you know that, that we're going to be sent down to Mexico. That was his. Uh, that was his prediction. Um, uh, NAFTA has had uh, has had mixed uh, you know mixed reviews since then. Although uh, it depends on you know you you you, uh, you sit where you stand. Uh, economists certainly aren't uh, confused about uh, the benefits of NAFTA. Almost universally, economists uh, recognize positive benefits for all three. Uh, economies and for and for firms and their ability to um, compete globally. Um, there, you know, people in labor unions. I'm from Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, the you know part of the you know one of the hearts of the uh, old industrial uh, North America. Um, labor is important there. The the you know the class of voters that were concerned about uh, uh, trade in NAFTA are are located there. Um, they have a different. They have a different view. Uh, we could say it's ill-informed, but they have a very deci decidedly different view about about trade and NAFTA in uh, in particular. The business community that is uh, uh, trading across uh, the you know the the two borders uh, are very positive. There are uh, you know businesses that will tell you that their very uh, survival and competitiveness uh, over the past. 20 years uh, is directly attributed to the gains they've been able and efficiencies they've been able to gain from NAFTA. Uh, politically, it's been uh, it's been an issue. Democratic candidates um, uh, have, uh, for president in particular, have uh, you know we've seen them when they're when they're uh, campaigning have been anti-NAFTA. When they're in government, they tend to be uh, in favor of trade and wanting to tr you know try to expand trade. Uh, this past year, uh, as we've all noticed, we had a Republican candidate. Uh, who was, you know, very uh, anti-NAFTA, as we've, you know, heard m you know, multiple times calling it the worst trade agreement in, uh, in the history of, um, of the country. The candidate is now president. Uh, he's trying to uh, fulfill his campaign promises uh, on, uh, on trade. He's done that on, on some things already, withdrawing the United States from, uh, from, uh, from TPP. He wants to, if not uh, withdraw, maybe withdraw. Uh, but uh, alter our relationship uh, and our the rules on uh, uh, with NAFTA. Uh, as I said, we had a very eventful week um, last week, where um, if we, you know, to the president's own reporting, uh, his own reporting on this was about to uh, initiate the withdrawal from NAFTA until the intercession from uh, the Prime Minister of Canada and President of uh, uh, of Mexico. Um, he, uh, I, I was reminded last week of my time as an undergrad economics 
student uh, back in the 80s where I, the very first economics paper I wrote was on softwood lumber. <laughs> on a so, you know, softwood lumber is back and bigger than ever. It's still a, still a big, uh, you know, big issue for us. Um, so we want to get into all of these issues and figure out, well, what does this all mean for trade today and going forward? What, you know, how, do we, how do we read this? How do we take it? And, and what should the plan be? And, and, uh, and maybe some of the things that we, uh, that we miss. We have an excellent panel. Uh, to, to discuss these things. Um, Ambassador uh, uh, Geronimo uh, Gutierrez, Ambassador, US Amb I'm sorry, Mexican Ambassador to the United States, just appointed in, um, in January. That's um, I don't know what you do to, you know, to, to have earned that uh, in, you know, this, at this time to be, uh, to be nominated, uh, but you're formerly CEO of the NAD Bank, which is a creature yes. of, um, of NAFTA and so some interesting perspective there as well, former subsecretary for uh, North America. I learned last night at, uh, at dinner uh, that you also, during your time in Texas, uh, learned how to do the Texas two-step, which oh, I, love it. I think is, uh, is also should be a mandatory requirement for anyone in your job is to be able to do the Texas two-step. Um, uh, uh, Moises Kalak. Kalak? Kalach. Either way is fine? Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, Moises is, is, uh, is a fierce proponent of, uh, of trade. He's played uh, a number of roles. He's in his, in his private life, in his full-time job, because you, you <laughs> realize he's got, all the time he spends on trade, you remember that he is senior vice president of uh, Grupo Caltex, a significant textile um, uh, business here in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, he is the strategic uh, international coordinator of Mexico's uh, private sector for uh, for trade negotiations, all trade negotiations, but in particular for, um, uh, and in this current uh, time at, uh, with NAFTA and U.S.-Mexico trade, representing the Mexican business community in trade negotiations. A really interesting and important role uh, that Mexico has to have private sector um, uh, at the table for, for these negotiations. Uh, he's chaired the Mexico Business uh, Coalition for the TPP, he worked very hard on uh, on TPP to try to open up access to uh, to Asia, and also served on uh, the APEC uh, Business Advisory Council and the U.S. Uh, and uh, Mexico-China um, um, uh, high-level committee mm -hmm. on trade. Um, to my right is uh, uh, Jody Hansen Bond from U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, Senior Vice President for the Americas. Uh, also a huge job. I mean, I think I was reading through. Because uh, I think of you as the Americas and trade, and it's literally you've got uh, eight different roles on the Americas <laughs> and trade, from uh, the the CAFTA countries to yeah. U.S. Brazil, to U.S. Mexico, um, and uh, and and leading that effort, which is critically important to the United States. And you're uh, you're right in the heart of all of these discussions in the United mm -hmm. States, giving guidance to uh, business community. Uh, representing to U.S. government, giving advice and counsel to our friends to the north and the south on what to make of um, uh, how we should do this in um, uh, if we do get to a, a uh, renegotiation. So wonderful to have uh, have you here. And then um, the Honorable Navdeep Baines, Minister of uh, Innovation, uh, Innovation, Science, and uh, Economic Development, which is the, the correspondent to our, our uh, in the United States, our Commerce Secretary, you saw your, your, your opposite number uh, earlier today and uh, looking for, um, uh, you know, reading the tea leaves of where, of any, any signals that, that uh, Wilbur Ross may have given uh, at lunch, which wasn't much. We were, I was hoping for more, but it wasn't. Um, it's more on the personal side of the conversation. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. Um, uh, you know, great history of, uh, of work on, on trade. And, and actually, one of the more uh, interesting things that you worked on was, uh, is actually internal trade in Canada also, which is, which is uh, you know, opening up. Uh, and we could do a whole panel just on, on, on the work that you did on uh, the agreement in Canada to open up trade internally, which was really, um, really fascinating. Um, so th that's our panel for this discussion. I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the ambassador, and I'm going to read you first a quote from Bill Clinton on the day that he signed the three ag uh, agreements. This is before passage in Congress, but he did a full, uh, robust defense of uh, of trade. But just this this quote from him, and I should say he had just talked about how the bipartisan nature of trade at that time. Um, to sign this agreement, uh, in the, the ceremony to sign the agreement, he had Presidents uh, Ford, 
Carter and uh, George H.W. Bush in attendance to sign uh, the, the, um, the three uh, U.S. Mexico uh, or NAFTA, what became called the NAFTA agreements. So he said this debate is about, this debate about NAFTA is about whether we will embrace changes and create the jobs of tomorrow or try to resist these changes uh, hoping we can preserve the economic structures of yesterday. I feel like that's kind of where we are uh, today on this, but if that was a debate, so what, I'll, what I'll ask you and ask the whole panel to weigh, on this, weigh in on this first question is, um, has someone won that debate? Are we still having that debate? Uh, who's, what, what, how are we doing on scorekeeping on it? Ambassador, I want to turn to you first. Well, uh, thank you very much, and, and thank you all for being here. Uh, very quickly, I, you know, th the view from the Mexican side and my own view is that uh, Na NAFTA has been uh, largely successful. On balance, it has been a very successful trade agreement for the three partners. Um, as you were mentioning, uh, there seems to be consistent and objective data that, that would point in that direction. Uh, whether people want to look at it or not, that's a different story. But the data seems to be there. Uh, number two is the main problem is perhaps that not all, well, have, have there been specific industries, firms, regions, subregions, subsectors that have had a difficult time? Yes, by all means. That's what free trade is all about. But that has happened in the three countries. And uh, I, I, I think that it's fair to say that there has been um, adjustment on the three countries. And in my view, the, lar the, the, vast, the majority of the adjustment, if you like, has already taken place. Mm. NAFTA is a 23-year-old agreement. And during that same time, there have been a lot of technological changes worldwide. The, the world trade system has also evolved. So I think it, it, one has to be careful to attribute it uh, to NAFTA specifically, uh, uh, some things that are not necessarily a result of NAFTA. Um, finally, the type of concerns that we hear right now are two. They may be to some extent valid. One is, you need to get. You, we need to. Be, we need to do a better job to get, especially small and medium-sized firm, into the mainstream opportunities that NAFTA provides. Uh, into the supply chains that have cr been created over the past 23 years. And that might be a, a, a valid criticism. Not everybody, not all industries, not all people are benefit from the opportunities that NAFTA does offer for the three countries. Mm -hmm. That may be uh, something of concern. The second thing is we need, to, w when people talked about, I, I may be getting a, a little bit ahead of myself here, but when when people talked about NAFTA 2.0, usually was in the sense that in order to remain competitive as a region, we need to do some changes. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily the changes that, with all due respect, are being advocated right now, or at least not all of them, by the U.S. administration. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we are, from the Mexican side, we're ready to review what are the things that we can do to improve NAFTA, uh, so long as you know we keep trade free. Yeah. We're not against you know fair trade. We want to be free and fair trade, and uh, that we we all come from the view that it has been a largely beneficial agreement, and that we think what are the possibilities that we can really look at when we engage in reviewing renegotiating NAFTA in a way that not you know, none of the parties get hurt. I, def I definitely want to spend uh, a good bit of time, and hopefully we can, we can do that diving into what are those things that we can, uh, mm -hmm. that we can improve in. Uh, Minister, are we, uh, is the, the, the debate raging still? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely topical. Yeah. Uh, as, as you saw from the remarks at lunchtime with uh, Secretary Ross. But I do agree with the ambassador, uh, which is if you look at the history of NAFTA, on balance, it's really been a win-win-win situation. Uh, obviously, certain sectors and certain regions have had challenges, but on balance, it's been very positive. Mm -hmm. uh, the overall growth of all three regions has doubled, more than doubled in the past uh, 23 years. So there's tremendous growth that's taken place, um, and I think that's highly attributable to uh, the trade agreement. I think the, the question I have for myself when we're having this conversation and the conversation we're having at the cabinet table as well 
is what is the problem we're trying to address? Mm -hmm. What is the underlying issues we're trying to address? And I think it was raised by the ambassador briefly around technology, mm -hmm. around automation, around displacement of jobs, around the changes in the job market. So I think we need to have a more candid and honest conversation of what are we trying to address? And if we're looking at uh, issues and challenges faced by the middle class and the anxieties they're facing in all three jurisdictions, and we're looking at issues around income inequality, for example, or some of the social challenges attributed to that, uh, you can't simply focus in on trade. Uh, you have to look at the broader context. And so in Canada, for example, you know, we, we firmly believe uh, for us to succeed, we actually have a very different take on trade, not only NAFTA, but we recently just negotiated and finalized a European Union free trade agreement, is really looking at uh, skills and innovation. Uh, we feel that people's anxieties and the anxieties that middle class Canadians are facing, and in general middle class uh, globally is facing, is around their job prospects and the job prospects for their children and grandchildren. So really what we believe is the discussion needs to include automation, needs mm -hmm. to include technology, and the impact that's having on the labor market. And, and we have to em embrace that in a positive way. Uh, when we introduced our innovation agenda in Canada, for example, in the last budget, it's not about us versus machines. It's not about us versus robots. It's about saying how can we really adopt technology to create more opportunities, more jobs. And I think once we had those conversations, there was far less anxiety around trade. And trade was viewed more positively because people appreciated some of those other realities that existed in the plants, on the plant floors, uh, that have transformed the way things are being built. Uh, and that's not necessarily a reflection of trade. Um, and also, if you look at it from a North American context, we've also been able to articulate very clearly that with Mexico and the U.S., uh, we've made more than, uh, we've tripled the amount of trade globally. Right. And that means our products are more competitive, they're more in demand. So we have low-cost jurisdictions, we have innovative jurisdictions, we have the ability to produce things that are of high quality. This region allows us to compete globally as well. And it's taken years and years to build these integrated supply chains. It's taken a long time to create this competitive advantage. Why would we want to undermine mm. something like that? So those are the kinds of conversations we're having. So Jody, so why is it why is it still <laughs> salient? Because we're, we're all saying it's a it's a you know it's a win. We can talk about evidence yeah. for it, it, it's a win. Um, you know, and yet we had uh, you know multiple candidates yeah. uh, critical of it. I still do. I mean, there's there's a, there's something about the you know the loudest voices are uh, anti trade I'm always still amazed uh, because if you watch TV and you only see uh, the the negative views being expressed about trade, uh, but like the Gallup polls still show actually remarkable durability and support yeah. for for trade. So oh, why why is it the, that we are though? Sure. Yeah. Well, just first, Tony, it, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, it's an honor to be on this panel, and it's really an honor to be with friends, allied partners, and the best neighbors, I think, that we could have in the United States um, under probably the best economic scenario we've ever had, comprising $1.3 trillion. And that is the North American Free Trade Agreement that we share with Canada and Mexico. And um, you did mention it's, the, it's been the proverbial punching bag mm -hmm. forever. I think that it's been able to withstand um, a, a few of the punches that come along the way during different campaigns because it is so durable, because it, com it constitutes 14 million jobs in the United States. It's been able to take uh, a couple punches here and there. But this has really been the first time where we've seen um, the wave or the streak uh, of populism that has challenged it to the point of almost the brink of uh, even a consideration of withdrawal last week. You know, I'd love to be in the other room talking about what to do about this populist streak um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and really reflect, Tony, um, in a broader discussion on, on something that the minister had mentioned, and that is that there is a country that is responsible for the loss of jobs in the United States. And that country is called innovation. And all of us are gonna have to deal with the fact that it's not just the challenge of today, but it will continue to tomorrow. So that's for a broader conversation. But today, in the here and now, what we recognized, um, and I'll just take two industries in particular, um, that had so much economic uncertainty due to job loss, 
but really had no intimate understanding of this broad narrative that comprises uh, the NAFTA architecture infrastructure, and that is one, the manufacturing sector in the United States, and two, the agriculture sector. First, on manufacturing, 800,000 jobs were created four years after NAFTA went into force in the United States. But we've recognized that uh, the current revenues from the exports actually uh, create 37500 almost $40,000 for every factory worker in the United States. So when a, when a thought of withdrawal comes up, you know, you think of a loss of $40,000 for every one of those factory workers that's part of this integrated supply chain. And I don't think that we've done a good job of talking um, deep down at the local level about those benefits. Um, and toward that, the second sector that I wanted to mention is agriculture. Um, most of America's farmers had no idea that NAFTA, that Mexico, that Canada were part of their sales infrastructure. They go through an intermediary. Uh, they sell to Cargill, Bungie, ADM. We realized we need to tell the farmers where your crops are going. <laughs> so in some way, this exercise has made us get really granular. Why didn't we do it before? You know, I was in global business, and you, I worked for a major US multinational, and you tend to go where the house is on fire. You tend to be focused where you're having problems. Quite frankly, North America, it was going so well, we weren't spending time on a deep education campaign across the United States about why we were doing so well. So this is a wake up call. And I think that uh, most of us are going to have to get uh, make an argument to this president as we did last week. Mm -hmm. And we found that uh, he does moderate um, his position. And, um, and I think America's farmers and America's manufacturers are needing to speak up while all of us are looking at what the real challenge is and how to deal with it in the long term. So we do have a communications problem. We have a communications <laughs> okay. problem. It's definitely, definitely a part of it. Yep. Moises, is the, so uh, we um, we sometimes hear, I mean, um, uh, with you know, Jody and I work a lot with the U.S. business community mm -hmm. on trying to deliver these messages and deliver messages to policy makers uh, about, you know, trade and lots of other issues, but especially on uh, on trade. But it's it's episodic. We come under criticism sometimes for, for having failed on sometimes to, uh, do, you know, doing the right education on this and uh, forcefully enough delivering the message. But uh, we have not heard a lot in the past. I think this is one of the welcome changes hearing from Mexican uh, mm -hmm. businesses. There's still a uh, this this view. If you go back to my hometown of Pittsburgh and talk to people of what they think it happens in, in Mexico, it's, uh, they still have this view that it's, it's, uh, it's avocados, jeans and t-shirts, and uh, Cancun, right? <laughs> and, right, that's what they, that's just how they it's not, it, it's, right, it's a really you know, old-fashioned view of, of Mexico. Mexico is not the same country it was 25 years ago. I, I would say that was a character 25 years ago, even. Um, but even uh, today, we talk about, you know, highly sophisticated, integrated supply chains, jobs you go down to, Juarez and see, uh, you know, R&D engineering facilities, and it's really, uh, really amazing. So the voice from Mexican business, I think, actually has an important role to play right, right now. Yeah, I'll say that uh, Mexico has grown a lot. We have a lot of problems to, to solve, but we've changed. Mm -hmm. We have FTAs with 46 countries. <laughs> so uh, we're doing something right. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, you can have the jobs discussion, but uh, I don't know if that's the only indice that should be up there. What type of jobs? Yeah. Is it uh, just manufacturing jobs on, that should be, should be the indice, or what type of jobs are we talking about? Uh, I'll say that uh, the other thing is, is this is a moving target. 23 years, uh, whatever you set as a goal in three, 23 years ago, it's going to be different. And it's going to be different in five years from now, so it's, it's, it's a moving target. Uh, Mexico has grown also. I think businesses have been totally integrated between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico now. If you mm -hmm. see a supply chain and if you follow a product today, it's really amazing. And uh, they mentioned that uh, my, uh, all, the, all of you mentioned data. It's, data is impressive. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, thousands of examples, but just 
the, let me tell you, Texas sells to Mexico $92 billion a year. Wow. Just, Just Texas. Uh, so when you, when you realize and you look into the uh, detailed information of, of, of the supply chains, you realize that there is business people in the three countries, that they're doing very good business, and some of this is becoming, uh, the noise is coming from the more the, on the political side. Of course, free trade has not managed to cover 100% of the spectrum, and not everyone is happy with it. But I think overall, uh, it's been very good for the, for the three countries. Definitely, it has been very good for Mexico. And I, I hopefully it would continue to be like that. Excellent. Actually, we, we heard a couple times it's this talk about, um, you know, what are the metrics that, that we're using to um, uh, to measure the success of a of a free trade agreement? We could, mm -hmm. it, it seems in politics, you can't escape this kind of talk about it. And even go I go back to that that Clinton statement uh, on it. And it's peppered with. Um, you know, promises uh, being very specific on the creation of you know jobs and um, the, you know this you know this president, but others uh, in the past have also used bilateral uh, trade uh, in goods uh, deficits or surpluses mm -hmm. as the measuring stick for uh, for whether a trade is succeeding or not. Which you know, if you're not schooled in um, in trade and national accounting and thinking about econ you know economies that way, it's it's a very rational way to do it. If you're you know a citizen back home just trying to understand, um, you know, so how how do we improve the, the, the way? We, how do we improve uh, telling people and telling the story about uh, you know supply chains and um, uh, you know ways that are elevating you know, standards of living and quality of jobs and those kinds of things. So I think, you know, we can't underestimate the importance of those metrics around jobs mm -hmm. and growth, and that's why I alluded to the fact that the economy more than doubled for all three jurisdictions since NAFTA came into place. There are nine million jobs from the U.S. perspective, you talked about 14 mm -hmm. for the overall context, but nine million jobs from the U.S. that are dependent on the Canadian economy. Mm -hmm. uh, 48 states, the top three customers, Canada. And so clearly, you know, I think telling that story is really important. Uh, obviously, the U.S. and Mexico markets are very important to Canada, but it's really, like you said, explaining to those in uh, manufacturing, those in agriculture, to tell them what really the story is. And so I think that's really important. So in terms of metrics and how we measure this going forward, uh, from our perspective, again, it goes down to um, really looking at, uh, from a North American perspective, the jobs aspect of it, the growth aspects of it, uh, but what are, what are the issues we're trying to deal with? Mm -hmm. What are those anxieties? And I talked about those. And so for us in Canada, when we talk about middle class, it's not an economic uh, necessarily benchmark with a medium income that we're focusing on, saying, okay, if you make X, you know, $35,000 or $40,000, it's really about a good quality of life, as you mentioned, a good education for yourself and your children, being able to retire with dignity, affordable housing. Those are the issues. And as long as those issues are being dealt with, then people generally feel secure about themselves right. and there's less anxiety and frustration. And then pol politicians won't exploit trade or won't exploit immigration mm -hmm. or won't uh, exploit globalization mm -hmm. and other factors for some of those challenges because that's really the narrative that's taken over. It's that politics of fear that's, and, and that's taken over from the, the economic benefits associated with trade and other things that we've done really well. And to your point, when it comes to integrated supply chains and uh, and illustrating that point, there's another good example. I was at the Great Lakes Forum uh, in Detroit, yeah. uh, and uh, I talked about, I gave a specific example from the automotive sector. You spent some time with Ford. That's right, so yeah. I started my career at Ford Motor Company, yeah. so full disclosure, <laughs> I want to make sure, hence the auto example. Yeah. But basically saying, look, when a vehicle part crosses the border six to seven times before a final vehicle is produced and finished and is on a driveway of a con customer in the U.S., it creates jobs on both sides. Uh, you know, I think Governor Snyder put it really well. Mm -hmm. He said an investment in Ontario for a car manufacturing is good for Michigan, right? So that's how integrated our economies are. That's how integrated our supply chains are. And so investments being made by car companies, for example, on either side of the border mm -hmm. are mutually beneficial. And it's not like one is at the expense of the other. And so I think we need to highlight those points. I think the Center for Automotive Research did a study on a border adjustment tax to illustrate this point and saying, look, if we were to thicken the border, if we were to cause impediments, if we were to increase tariffs, say, by 20%, it would increase the price point of a light vehicle by $2,000.
It would uh, cause significant job losses on both sides of the border, over 31,000 immediately in the U.S. in the automotive sector. And it would also uh, have impact on fuel and the cost of fuel because a lot of the oil and gas uh, from the U.S. comes from Canada. And so the point is, if you look at it again, dealing with that issue, middle class Americans, they don't want to pay more for their vehicles. Yep. They don't want to lose right. good quality jobs and they don't want to pay more for fuel. So those are the kinds of conversations we need to have with people saying, look, yes, you know, when you're talking about NAFTA, for example, and you talk about impediments to the border, here are the intended consequences and here are some of the unintended consequences. And do you fully appreciate that? And I think when you put it in that context, then I think it deals with the communication challenges uh, that we talked about. But we have to do a better job. And I think the automotive example really illustrates how integrated our economy is, how often a part crosses the border yeah. before it's finalized and, and, and put in the final vehicle and sold to a <coughs> consumer. And that creates good quality jobs on both sides of borders and even in Mexico and all three sides of the border as well. Um, so, you know, so I think it's obviously we have a whole panel of, uh, of uh, um, you know, NAFTA supporters here. So it's not, <laughs> not the diversity. So I'm going to, I'm going to, um, uh, it's very hard for me to do. So I'm going to put, I'm going to play, um, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's, just a little bit of devil's advocate on this because, uh, you know, some of it is not explaining. And, and actually, I'd love to hear just some of the examples uh, or, or the sense of this from both Mexico and, um, uh, and Canada. Uh, also, because we think about it a lot in the U.S. perspective, but you know, we there is this problem of um, you know, we th all of the all of these gains or a lot of the gains that um, uh, that you just uh, described and that we tend to talk about um, when we talk about the benefits of trade, they are dispersed over the the, the, the you know the whole economy, and there, there are some uh, places where we can talk about specific um, you know specific things, but there are you know there is acute pain right I mean actually if you don't know that trade can be disruptive to certain sectors and certain firms then you know then you don't really understand trade it's by design it is supposed to be you know uh, increasing competition and getting new uh, entrants into markets and it should be it should be disruptive we know what to do with a factory when it's been disrupted you know, you can, you know, you can, you know, write it off, you could sell it, you could redevelop it, you could turn it into a mall, there's all kinds of different things you can do with it, uh, loft housing or something. But, um, but a person who's worked in a, um, a person who's worked in a factory for 20 years and is only 38 years old and has another 20 to 25 years of work ahead of them has been disrupted. And those are the kinds of people who are most concerned about trade and they don't, you know, they, uh, you could tell them that 85% of the reason that they've lost their job might actually be, you know, technology or management uh, techniques. Uh, but some of it's trade, but they attribute it to trade. So how do we, um, what do we do with that really important asset that we have in our economy for that time and, uh, and, and help them understand the world around them a little bit better? And is this, is this an issue <coughs> in, in Mexico as well, Ambassador? Of course. I, I, I think that... People relate to stories, not to that. Mm -hmm. Normal people yeah. are not like us, yeah. <laughs> to say, yeah. to put it in some way. No, we're abnormal. Uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> re they re a they relate to stories. Yeah. So we, uh, I think, one of the challenges is is explain. You know, if we go to this type of forum, I'm often in them. We basically all use the same bullet points, yeah. and we are a group of people talking in a sense to each other, patting ourselves in the back and saying NAFTA has been great. Go and tell that to a guy in Pittsburgh who lost his job. Mm -hmm. The same I would say go and tell to a farmer, you know, a, a corn farmer in Mexico that lost his land. Yeah. It's exactly the same. So um, I, I think three things are necessary. Uh, I, I see it obviously from the Mexican perspective. Number one, the very obvious, we need to explain the size of the market. Number one, people in the States might be inclined to think that we, you know, we, it's only, it's only uh, you know, jobs going to Mexico. That, that Mexico buys more together than, as it's often said, you know, ill-intended, than the BRICS. It's yeah. a $250 billion market. And not everybody, perhaps, in the States know about that. Just simply the size of the Mexican market. Number two, the stories. There are a lot of Mexican firms that are creating employment precisely in the Rossville, in the auto industry. And they are, you know, they, they might be producing, they might have a factory in Pittsburgh, and they also have a factory in Mexico, 
and they are, you know, just fully integrated. And those are the so. So we need to explain how the the supply uh, chains really operate. Mm -hmm. uh, we often find ourselves comparing NAFTA, but to what? what, what the, the right question is, what would happen if NAFTA was not there? Yeah. And A, it's very difficult to think that North America would be competitive. Mm -hmm. Actually, now they worldwide without NAFTA. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the harm would be, in my view, far greater. And then, quite frankly, we need to, talk, we need to move this. You know, we often say, oh, we, you know, Mexico and the US change, exchange at least $1.5 billion every day. It's a great number. But tell that to someone, someone might say, well, what does that mean to me? So we need to go and take it even to the district, the state level, and to the district level and say, you know this plant that you have here? Well, it happens to exist because of trade, not in spite of trade. And I think that, yes, it, it, there's, I, I wouldn't call it a, there's a communication gap that those who advocate for NAFTA, as we do, uh, from the different countries, we need to fill that gap. And then there are other policies, that's for sure, that are needed to bring, uh, you know, to take people, the, the person you were, you know, hypothetical person that is on this factory, the United States, the same happens in Mexico. And, and uh, Moy can talk about, you know, the textile sector in Mexico. Yeah. No? Um, we need to explain that there are other types of policies that would help someone like that transition to a different sector. But that is happening in the three countries, and that is happening worldwide. Yeah. It's not actually, again, as a result of that. It's not unique to that. Then it's, yeah. We're going to, um, I should say, we, we, you know, prepare questions. We are going to have, um, we are going to have time uh, for questions. But I want to move this discussion into um, sort of looking backwards as to what we, you know, what we've done, what we learned, but actually looking forward. Uh, this, we, this is supposed to be of the mm -hmm. future NAFTA, and uh, that's what I really, really want to dive into. And I, I would like for uh, Jody and Moises to um, to weigh in on on the future of NAFTA in this way. And that obviously, so we are, you know, supporters of uh, of NAFTA. NAFTA is not perfect, and mm -hmm. NAFTA is um, a you know a structure that is you know a few decades old now. Um, if uh, uh, you know, if if you know, if we forget who is, you know, who, which administration is in power or uh, just, you know, set that aside and say, you know, if we we're just going to look at NAFTA today after, you know, 25 years of, of uh, uh, nearly 25 years of being in place, what would we do to fix it? What, what, what aspirationally should we be looking at? What is the business community who's been, uh, who's had to deal with the structure of NAFTA today? Uh, what are they looking for? What did we learn from the TPP uh, negotiations and the you know, you know Mexico has uh, FTAs with 46 countries. We only have FTAs with 14, 14 countries roughly. Um, so you've 20. done a lot of work on, on FTA since yeah. then. Yeah. 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 So what are, what are we what are we looking for? What would improve uh, NAFTA if we could um, if we could, when we get to that point? Well, I think because of a. Um, because of how much has been discussed publicly, what I really want to do is, in the immediate, talk about process. Mm. And maybe, Moises, if you want to talk about substance, right? Okay. Does that sound good? <laughs> uh, most specifically that uh, we have been communicating uh, to the administration uh, very focused on process. A couple top line messages. And first, do no harm. This thing is so good for North American competitiveness. If you look at China, it's got 1.3 billion people. The United States, when you combine it with Canada and Mexico, you actually go up to about almost 500 million people. That's pretty, you know, that improves your, your playing field in terms of um, competitiveness considerably. So there are all these attributes uh, to the integrated economic environment. So first, do no harm. Um, the second issue is that keep it trilateral. You know, any disruption to try to go bilaterally, the business communities uh, are so destabilized by that because if anything, trade agreements give you rules of the road and operating procedures and access in a certain way. I actually think we destabilize our three countries in the economic architecture. So, 
stay is it, is it trilateral. Is it possible to even uh, negotiate it bilateral? I mean, I know there's some people who... who well, people Canada who had a bilateral with the United States yeah. existing. Yeah. That's right. um, but, but now it, that it's in place, is it, is it possible? Uh, the, well, the administration yeah. early on, because yeah. uh, as... Uh, who was it? Munchkin this morning said, you know, Trump has been very open to many ideas, and I know one of the ideas that was bannered about was to go bilateral, and we very quickly uh, uh, indicated that that would be enormously disruptive um, to our own economy in the United States, uh, to the president and his team, um, because our businesses will find other options. Uh, any, and, that, and that gets me actually to my third point, that we've communicated very clearly uh, beyond first do no harm, uh, stay trilateral, is that expediency. Um, to wrap this up very quickly, I would argue that even to my first point of first do no harm, there has been great market interruption already, just based on the um, uncertainty over NAFTA. Uh, investors tend to uh, withhold making future investments. I went up to Montreal to speak, and they said I'd be speaking in front of, you know, 25 business leaders. There were 700 <laughs> business leaders we have a lot in of a people conference. In a lot of people <laughs> in Canada. I'll we, tell you, know, you the what. The latest census, 35 million plus strong. <laughs> I'll tell get. you Good what. All but, very nice and polite people, You know, too. look, geography <laughs> is destiny, right? Yes, we're yeah. together based Absolutely. upon our borders and our, our shared space together. And those 700 business leaders were saying, you know, this has got us up in arms and I'm withholding our investments in certain areas because I don't know what the United States is going to do. In Mexico, the disruption has caused, I would say, a little bit of anti-American sentiment. I mean, our American Chamber of Commerce said our businesses are dealing with this growing uncertainty or boycotting of our products. You know, that's not what we want. Uh, we want more trade, not less. That's what the President said. That's what the Treasury Secretary said mm -hmm. this morning. And I think that in order to not disrupt what we have and to build upon or modernize something, we need to do it fairly quickly and probably use a process-based rules approach. We've, we've been saying amend it, don't end it. Use the amendment mm -hmm. process also use Trade Promotion Authority, what's called TPA, because it allows the Congress quickly to galvanize around something, but it needs to be expedient. This isn't the moment in time for a Christmas tree approach to everything you wanted, because I can assure you that businesses will flock elsewhere outside of this important I don't market. Think, I think that's a great point. I don't think it's been widely understood that, you know, just the chilling effect that it the has chilling effect. On, uh, on, in, on investment. Uh, what, what, um, you know, how, how could, how could, what, what does modernization of, of NAFTA mean, if we use that phrase? Well, we, we have to agree that after 23 years, not even the internet was there when we did this right. deal. So that's true. There is a, there, there's a whole bunch of changes yeah. there. So uh, you have this huge uh, uh, section of the TPP, which is intellectual property, mm -hmm. which could be. Everyone will agree to add that up to the new NAFTA, which just takes into account the whole uh, process of patents and the whole process of what, what's going on in Silicon Valley and other places in the world. So th there are some things like that, a clear example that uh, I'm sure the three countries can agree to. Let's just add this up, but let's add it up not as a, in a dis disruptive manner. Let's just do it on an orderly manner. Uh, you were saying about uh, labor uh, displacement. We didn't take that into consideration when this happened. Yeah. Uh, there is an educational process behind that. It's not necessarily uh, only free trade. You have a technology changes, as the ambassador said. How are we going to deal with it? Well, we need to have educational policies that is much different. If you close trade, it's not going to benefit the three countries. If you do more education, probably it will. So I'll say there's a couple of chapters there. Uh, there are some environmental issues that mm -hmm. are, have changed a lot also. Uh, uh, even uh, Secretary Ross has uh, spoken out uh, a lot about enforcement. Yeah. When we when this deal was done, uh, there were no FDAs out there. Well, there was a couple, but not as big as this. Uh, we should uh, endorse enforcement against free trade and fair trade. So those are things we could in integrate to the new NAFTA. 
Uh, just make sure we do it quick. I agree with Jody. Uh, business doesn't like to stay wandering around for six months, waiting to see what are the new rules. And also, we don't want to get into the political timing of this, but we have an election next year, which uh, definitely uh, is not going to be nice to have the yeah. NAFTA up there for, for grabs. So uh, I think we need to put some margins on it and say, okay, we want to deal this 20 issues, mm -hmm. sit at the table, do it in an institutional way, which uh, means no social media. And <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> probably it's better. And then, so deal it at the table, uh, have, a, have a wrapped up uh, uh, deal with the three countries. And, uh, and let the political process follow up, but make sure businesses uh, know what's there and certain, with certainty. How are we doing with questions? We have, uh, do we have any questions from, from the audience? Yeah, I think we have one right here. Hi, Rick Newman with Yahoo Finance, also from Pittsburgh, Go Steelers. Um, go question Penguins for Jody, right so you said you've communicated those three messages. What have you been able to tell, uh, um, what have they told you in return, or have you seen any indication that they've received those messages and they're heeding them? Sure. I think that last Wednesday was probably the most, or the loudest we've communicated, or the most uh, viscerally that we've communicated with everyone who we could speak with. Um, that when we heard that there potentially was an order to withdraw, as the president indicated himself, was, mm -hmm. uh, was very serious, uh, we, that's when we realized that we needed to make the arguments that hadn't been heard. We had had several members of the business community uh, going in and talking with Secretary Ross and talking with Gary Cohen and talking with Peter Navarro and talking with members of this administration um, who had indicated that there would be a, a thoughtful approach, but obviously the president has, has uh, made his viewpoints um, very well known, um, and yet we didn't have really a moment in time uh, where we needed to communicate very quickly, which we did last Wednesday. And because we'd built out an infrastructure of businesses and farmers and ranchers and exporters that uh, could communicate with the president, boy, did he hear it from the balancing body. Um, and that is also a, a component of this that we haven't discussed today, which is the, the legislators who oversee um, any sort of rethink on NAFTA. And I think that uh, whether it's the Senate Finance Committee chairman or the, or the House Ways and Means Committee or the Foreign Relations Committee members, they, they too were communicating into the president and um, who has, a, has a, and a growing and appreciative team to actually listen. Um, so I'm grateful that the, the finally culminated in these phone calls from the leaders mm -hmm. um, from the North and South, and, and that the president had some good data that we were all able to galvanize and get in there for. Yeah, I think the uh, the, the voice of uh, Congress in this has been, yeah. has been it, it ignored a little bit, and even you, you heard a little frustration from uh, from Wilbur Ross this morning yeah. when he said, well, you know, fast, fast track, but it's not really fast. You know, we got to send a letter up, and it's 90 days to start another 90 days, and that yep. doesn't sound fast to me. And I was thinking, well, you know, uh, Congress actually, you know, has actually grants, cedes some authority to the administration to deal with trade, and their voice is is, is really uh, uh, is really important with this, and I think they're going to use it. I think we had a question over here. You have the microphone. Oh, right there, you go. Thanks. Hi, <coughs> yeah, Ed Hurst with uh, BlackBerry. Um, I wonder if our two uh, government representatives from Mexico and uh, Canada could comment on. What was said by the president and the prime minister to President Trump <laughs> that, <laughs> that convinced him to change? And then to the extent you can talk about it and know about it. And then what you could talk about is what compromises do you think each of your countries could make that have you know, an impact on the American worker? Not necessarily yeah. the more technical things. Something that would help the dairy farmers or the factory workers. I understand the aggregate arguments, but getting to the point made earlier, what has an actual impact so that the deal would look better from the perspective of American workers or farmers mm. that your countries could give? If, if I may, just on that question. Yes, please. Yeah. I think the number one country that creates the most job opportunities is innovation, mm -hmm. right? So the point is, you know, we talk about innovation and how it can displace workers and how it can cause challenges, and it's going to get 
more and more challenging in some areas. The autonomous vehicles, a lot of our countries, a lot of the integrated supply chains are connected to the transportation sector, for instance, right? But at the same time, that is one area that presents enormous opportunities for growth as well. So I think that is a frustration I feel a bit. I think there's just so much focus on just trade and through the trade, trade lens about how this is going to really solve the anxieties the middle class people are facing that's going to create the jobs, that's going to improve the quality of life, that's going to make us more competitive. So I think we need to reframe the conversation per se. Uh, with respects to uh, what the Prime Minister said, we've been very clear and consistent. Uh, we made the case that we really want to have a win-win-win situation. We really believe that in the context of North America, this has allowed us to be competitive. And we've articulated, we've given many examples. And I've had the opportunity to go to Michigan to speak to my counterparts there. We have 10 ministers at the cabinet table, for example, that have been assigned specific states that go out and speak to, you know, congressmen and women that are speak to state legislatures uh, and are speaking and, and conveying the message of the mutual benefits. And again, that whole communication education process. I think the prime ministers didn't say anything that was anything provocative, uh, nothing new very consistent. I think it's just about being very consistent uh, and having the right tone and relationship, mm -hmm. not overreacting. Even to soft for lumber, to, to be honest with you, the comments made by Secretary Ross earlier today, I fundamentally disagree with his viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly disagree with his viewpoint, but it's how we approach it, right? We, we made our case in the U.S. courts. We made our case at the NAFTA tribunals. We made our case at the WTO. We're very confident about our position, but that issue doesn't define us. Our relationship is much bigger than that. So I think when you talk about it in that context, cooler heads prevail. It's not to get goaded into one particular issue. If dairy comes up or softwood comes up, you know, we're not going to allow one or two issues to define this very important relationship. And I think that tone, that relationship, and that just explaining of the mutual benefits of that win-win-win situation with regards to NAFTA is really what the Prime Minister and our Cabinet colleagues and even our MPs and business community has conveyed. And we have great supporters in the U.S. from the business side of it uh, who understand and appreciate that point of view as well. So there's nothing new, there's nothing provocative, there's nothing that is said to redirect, no negotiations, no side deals. Uh, we're prepared, we'll do our homework, uh, and uh, we're confident that we can deal with issues as mentioned before on the digital economy, mm -hmm. e-commerce, on services. Yeah. These things were not you know, robust or comprehensive when we dealt with, with the first NAFTA agreement. Uh, procurement, uh, this was a big deal when we did our European Union free trade agreement. Very big deal when we did the Canadian free trade agreement within Canada amongst the provinces and territories. So there's a lot of opportunities to modernize. There's many opportunities for us to strengthen NAFTA. And so we see it as a positive, um, but we're not gonna allow these small issues to really become the flashpoint and undermine something that's really successful. Ambassador? Well, um, uh, you, I suspect you made some calls yourself, too. Yes, but yeah. I, I mean, I wasn't certainly <laughs> on, the, on the call on the part of the presence. But, but you know, what, what I imagine the, they say, my president said, is pretty much what other people in, within the United States have been saying to President Trump and his administration, which are basically three things. First is, you know, uh, this is not exactly the way it has been framed to you. Um, number two, they are, it's no longer about buying from each other, it's about producing together mm -hmm. so we can have, as a region, export to other areas and yes, trade among ourselves. Uh, number three, there is a serious uh, possibility that uh, a major setback in our trilateral relations can take place. We have to be careful with that, especially at a time where the, the world is, is, is a pretty messy, messy place right now as it is. Uh, we don't consider us to be, uh, you, know, we're, you know, we consider to be partners, not in any way a threat. The United States is quite busy with many other world challenges. This is, you know, NAFTA is, it's, in a sense, it's a haven given what is going on worldwide. And, and number four is, you know, Mex neither Mexico or Canada started this discussion. Uh, again, to my initial comments, when we when we talked about uh, NAFTA 2.0, you know, some years back, it was it was really about, okay, we need to be more competitive as a region. What else can we do together? It wasn't about mm -hmm. imposing new you know new tariff or non-tariff restrictions to the trade that we have, and. The question about what is it that we, well, first of all, we need to understand what the U.S. position is. Because uh, as, as it was mentioned, 
it has not been formally notified to the U.S. Congress no. uh, on the part of the administration. So uh, I think we do have to be careful. As soon as that notification takes place, I think we, all the parties would have a better sense of what are the U.S. objectives in terms of this review and eventually um, modernization of NAFTA. Uh, but there are, I'll give you some things that are, you know, I, I think they're pretty uh, easy to think that could be on the agenda. Enforcement, that's something that concerns us, <laughs> making trade, uh, you know, working together to enforce the rules that we have among ourselves and also vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And I think that's an area where, where there's interest uh, on, on the three sides. Uh, if there are ways in which we can buy more of each other, that's by all means, let's look at those. So long as we're not hurting the supply chains, the global supply chains that have been established. Those two things are, and, and, and then, um, as Moises was saying, it's 23 years, are there's I'll mention the Mexico energy sector. When NAFTA was signed 23 years ago, the energy sector was specifically sidelined yep. as this is a non-starter. Well, it just happens to be that Mexico has undergone recently the most comprehensive reform in the energy sector in, in its history. And it creates huge opportunities for uh, Canadian and U.S. firms to invest in Mexico, to partner with Mexican yep. firms, to supply products as Mexico re re and we're, we, you, you know, you're also going to miss on that opportunity. Right. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think we have. Uh, I think we have time for one last question here. So, hi, I'm uh, Jason Grumay. I run the Bipartisan Policy Center. Mr. Ambassador, you look good. Last time I saw you, the president was signing the immigration order. So you, you look good today. Um, <laughs> I wanted to follow up. I think Moises, you raised the issue of um, Mexican political situation. We focus a lot very kind of narcissistically on U.S. politics and often forget that there are other democracies with their own pressures. Mm. And I think one of my greatest concerns in this entire conversation is how it actually, our nationalism could inspire your own. And I wonder if you could just speak a little more about the timing and the importance of how this issue is playing in the Mexican political context. Well, I'll, I'll jump back in, Moy, if you allow me. I think that's more for the ambassador. Let, let me, Mr. Let me Mr. Just, <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, let, please. Let, let, you know, th there is, um, if you look, I'll, I'll, I'll just make two quick comments. The first one is, um, over the course of the, the, you know, the past 20 years, um, on the Mexican side, gringo bashing, if I may use that, you know, common expression, has become less attractive and less popular. If you look at some of the polls that measure how Mexicans view the United States, I think that it has consistently improved over the last you know, 20 years, and especially over the last 10 years. There's a particular poll that it's uh, carried by the uh, university in Mexico. And it asks, among several other questions, is what percentage, you know, do Mexicans trust the United States? It's a very open-ended question. And I can't remember the data exactly, but that you know, has been consistently, the people that distrust the United States in Mexico had consistently been declining from levels of around 45%, I think, say, six years ago, you know, 45, 40, 30, and we were about you know, 30, low 30%. The poll hasn't been published. It went in two months to 80%. Yep. And I'm, I mean, because Mexico, Mexicans over the last 20 years were under the notion that in spite of our differences and in spite of the fact that, you know, we do have, ha you know, we, you know ha we do have a complex relationship, we were partners. And quite frankly, politicians from different parties, at least from the two parties that have governed Mexico uh, so far at a presidential level basically you know explain Mexicans and say you know this is part this is the right way to go and then suddenly our partner comes out and say I don't want you anymore I think that's not a good thing especially geopolitically it doesn't make sense as Moises was saying next year 
we're going to have an election in Mexico. Mexico has, you know, built strong democratic institutions in my view. But it's just not a wise decision to go with an open trade negotiation to any presidential election. And that's why we have stressed that, you know, we would like to see, and I think the administration, the U.S. administration, is pretty much wants to get this, say, done as soon as possible, to try to reach at least an overarching agreement before the year's end, even if that implies that later, it would, you know, some things might be submitted to the legislature. Mm -hmm. But if we can agree what, you know, what, what are the main objectives and what are we trying to achieve, that will probably be okay. Because if not, the risks are there. I'm gonna, uh, our session time is over, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that as our last word. And I think, but about all of us here, if we can, um, I think it's gonna be our job uh, collectively to commit ourselves to, you know, getting back to that trusting relationship and helping, I think, helping this administration yeah. do that. Uh, and if we can get to a, a, a uh, you know, a, a NAFTA that works best for all countries. I wanna congratulate us on, um, and not getting deep into you know amber boxes and red boxes and rules of origin and all the other <laughs> stuff that we <coughs> usually dive into in uh, in trade uh, in trade discussions, but also thank um, thank everyone from the panel for uh, for making it, all of you uh, for uh, for coming and for the great questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.